right? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Dr. Becky Funk. I am here at the Great Plains Veterinary Educational Center, uh, as Casey said, but uh, I've only been here since about last January, and before that I was in private practice, and so I have been tasked to um, talk to you about, yes, some sticky situations. I wish I had thought of that for my title, Casey. Would have been a lot better than than what I have. <laughs> so um, I always start out with producers. There's a few rules of engagement when we're talking about dystocia or calving problems. Um, my number one rule is uh, use obstetrical lube. It's there for a reason. It makes your job easier. It's easier on the cow. Um, it's easier on the calf if everything is is nice and slick and we can manipulate things without drying that uterus out, without losing those fluids. Um, it's just a good rule of thumb. Uh, Lindsay, if you were on last week, showed J-Lube. The one thing to keep in mind with J-Lube, it is an excellent lube, um, but it is also toxic if we have to do a C-section. So if there's any thought that we're gonna have to do surgery on that animal, um, I shy away from J-Lube pretty heavily. Uh, my preference is just a good water-based lube um, purchased in gallon quantities. Don't feel like you have to be chintzy with it. Uh, so looked up on Valley Vet right now, uh, a, a gallon of lube is running just over $10. So it's not a big investment um, for something that can make your life easy. The other thing I tell folks is always take the time to assess the situation and know what your game plan is. Uh, if you get that cow or heifer up and you um, get your hand in there, check her, um, kind of have a game plan in mind. Know if you're not familiar with what you've got and don't kind of know where you're going, then it might be time to think about a plan B rather than, than dealing with that situation on your own. Um, always take the time to set your chains or straps properly uh, to prevent injury to both the cow and the calf. And that's super important for that calf. Um, we can and do see um, broken legs in calves every spring from chains that are set wrong. Um, and then we put too much traction on them. So we wanna have that loop above the fetlock and then we wanna have that half hitch below the fetlock. Um, the diagram here shows that really well. Uh, if it doesn't make sense to you or you're a hands-on person and you need to, to run through that a couple of times, ask your vet to show you. Um, you can do it on a broomstick or an ax handle. Um, just practice setting those chains because it's super important. Um, the next thing is it's never wrong to call for help. Uh, if you, like I said, if you get in there and you're not certain about what your game plan is or you're not certain about what you've, you've got, the, the live calf and that healthy cow uh, is the goal. So if, if you're out of your element and you're not real sure what, what you've got going on, uh, make the call sooner rather than later. Um, patience is definitely a virtue when delivering a calf. Um, it's not something that we need to rush. If, if the extra few seconds it takes to rush that calving is what's going to save the life of that calf, you were probably too late already. Um, the other one is always check for another calf. Right, uh, we've all seen those where we bring that cow in that's maybe not feeling real good in a couple days and realize that there was a twin in there uh, and that uh, we should have checked for that second one. Uh, and honestly, I always check for the third one too. It doesn't happen very often, but, but um, my deal is keep going back in there until you know she's empty. Um, super, super important is never try to muscle your way through a difficult calving. Uh, calving, successful calving, successful dystocia corrections, um, they're not a strength and speed event. They're very much about technique and timing um, and having that patience and that skill to manipulate that calf. Uh, just a quick refresher, everybody probably knows, the, knows this, but there's three stages of labor. Um, stage one is that um, that restlessness, isolation, that cow is looking for that um, spot that she's going to pick away from the herd that she's going to lay down and have that calf. Uh, stage two is what we actually think of as calving, labor and delivery, um, starts with those membranes, that water bag, and then hopefully ends with that successful delivery of that calf. Uh, it can last anywhere from 20 minutes to a couple hours. Uh, heifers are generally slower. We give them a little more time to work through the process. Um, but we should see progress 
progress every hour is something you'll see um, put out there. Really honestly, probably progress every half hour is more accurate. And what I mean by progress isn't that um, isn't that we're getting to the getting that calf out in a half an hour, but once you see those fetal membranes, then that next half hour, maybe you want to see toes. And then once you see toes, you want to see progress towards a nose. Um, and then once that nose shows, things should go pretty quickly and we should have that calf out and on the ground. Um, and then stage three is that shedding of maternal membranes, uh, cleaning. The point I always make here is that if, if we don't clean within the first several hours, we consider that a retained placenta. The old process used to be that we go in and we clean that cow, right? We remove those placental, member those placental membranes. We now know that that actually does a lot of damage to those attachments in that uterus and that it can jeopardize uh, pregnancies down the road. So we don't actually mechanically clean those cows anymore. Um, we let the, the body do the work of breaking that down and, and shedding it out, uh, even if it takes a while. The only time we really intervene is if that cow is systemically ill, if she's looking punky or off, um, then we may intervene with some antibiotics, but we're not gonna mechanically go in and damage that uterus to get those membranes out. Um, the physics of labor and calving are fairly important. Uh, and the reason it's important to know that is because our goal is to work with that cow and calf to get that dystocia corrected, not um, to work against them or to do any damage. So um, pelvic shape is important. If any of you guys uh, have your vet do uh, pelvic measuring, you may have had them comment that um, we've got a flattened pelvis or a pelvis that's more square than rectangular. Uh, those are important things to note because it can, it can lead to some issues with calving just because that pelvis is designed to be that nice upright rectangle that fits that calf and that calf fits through there nicely. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is the picture of the, the cow. Um, this picture here kind of demonstrates that nice arc that that calf travels through from the uterus up over that pelvic canal and then out. So um, that is important when we're talking about manipulating that, that fetus to get it in the correct position because what we're doing is trying to get in at a position that we're gonna be able to fulfill that arc and make uh, delivering that calf as easy as possible. Um, so this, there's lots of these out here. If this is something that interests you, you can Google um, uh, cattle dystocia and you'll come up with a lot of these. Um, just shows some different uh, malpresentations that we deal with and how those are sitting in the uterus. And the reason I try and get people to get a little bit familiar with this is because when you call me and you describe what you've got, if you can tell me a little bit about what you've got going on, um, then a lot of times I can assess whether it's something that I can talk you through um, that you're capable of correcting, or if it's something that I'm going to say that sounds like an issue. We should we should be looking at that. Let's let's make some arrangements to get get where we need to be. Um, Maternal fetal mismatch is one of the probably more common dystocias that we deal with. Uh, it's probably a common dystocia that a lot of times you can work out yourself, uh, depending on, on how bad the mismatch is. Uh, generally, heifers are overrepresented in this population just because of the simple fact that they're still growing and they don't have um, that mature pelvic space that we're looking for. Uh, we can often end in a cesarean section at this one. Just to preserve, we want to make sure we get that live calf and that healthy mother. Um, so a lot of times we'll make the decision to go to C-section to, to preserve that. Um, there's two different kinds of maternal fetal mismatch. Relative oversize is what we normally think of as heifers, right? We have a fairly normal sized calf, but maybe a dam that's not quite mature enough or not quite big enough to have that calf. Um, absolute oversize is what's represented in this picture uh, where we have a, a large calf with a normal size dam. This is a 160 pound calf that we actually delivered by C-section, um, actually out of a fairly good sized mature cow, but 162 pounds takes a fairly large hole and she wasn't equipped for that. Uh, if we're starting to see a lot of mismatches um, for one reason or the other, either one, it's probably a good idea to start looking at our herd, genet herd genetics, um, whether we're selecting those heifers appropriately, uh, whether our bull selection is quite right for what we're doing uh, on our maternal side, um, or maybe we're just making some mating decisions that just aren't quite a good match for our herd. Um, something like this, this was an AI calf, um, that, that just probably wasn't the best mating uh, for this cow for whatever reason. 
things I like to look for for uh, a maternal fetal mismatch that's going to cause us problems or maybe end in a C-section. Uh, when that cow goes to push on that calf, if those feet tend to gravitate together and cross over, that's a good, a good sign that maybe those shoulders are really wide. So when she pushes, that pelvis is pushing those shoulders together and crossing those feet. Um, if we're unable to get both the head and both feet into that pelvic canal at the same time, um, that's a really good indicator that things just aren't going to work out. We just don't have enough space. Um, the other thing I like to look at or, or have people look at if they get their chains on and get things set and they're just doing some good traction by hand, if we're not able to make at least a little bit of progress when we do that, we're probably looking at something that's going to end up in a C-section. Uh, so the breech calving is the one that really gives everybody fits. Um, it is a, it's a great lesson in physics um, because it has to utilize opposing forces to correct this one. In other words, we have to be able to push that calf forward either with a good push on its butt or we have to be able to push that hock forward in order to pull that foot up at the same time. So a lot of times it's a two-person job um, depending on how you're set up. My arms are long enough, I can usually do it with one person, um, but it's definitely a bit of a challenge. Uh, the key thing on this one is if you are going to correct them, we really have to protect that uterine wall. Um, usually I will go ahead and when I get that foot up, I'll reach down and cup that foot in my hand as I bring it over that pelvic edge. Otherwise we run the risk of putting a hole in that uterus right there by that pelvis. And then um, like in this picture here, you can see um, the other trick is, so we've got our, our calving chain around the fetlock, and then what's really a little bit hard to appreciate in this picture is we've run it up forward and between that calf's toes. So when we pull on that chain, it actually picks those toes up off the pelvic wall or off the uterine wall. So different things like that, we just have to keep in mind to make sure that we protect that, that cow as we're trying to get that calf delivered. Um, and then timing is key. Uh, if you're trying to work against that cow's contractions when she's really pushing, uh, it's really hard to make progress. So you just kind of really have to get figured out that rhythm where you can, you can make those adjustments between contractions and between those big pushes. Um, and that's where that other person comes in handy because when, when she stops pushing, you, if you're ready to push forward, somebody else can pull up at the same time um, and hopefully pop that foot up. So. And then the, this is the only calving I will tell people that once you get that calf up and get those hips in the pelvis, um, we are gonna work with a little bit of speed. Once we get that calf pulled into the pelvis, that umbilical cord gets clamped off and that's where things get critical. That's where we lose calves in a breech calving a lot of times because once we clamp that umbilical cord off, he needs to be out where he can get a breath. So, so that is one thing get everything ready and be ready to go because once you start pulling these, once you make that assessment that you're gonna be able to get it corrected and get it pulled, they need to be out pretty quickly. Uh, the head back calving, um, we get calls on a lot. Sometimes they're very correctable, um, but the reason I say that they always require careful evaluation before we correct them is because you can work and work and work and work at these head back calvings and get that head down and then realize the reason that head back was because that pelvis was small enough that every time that cow pushed the calf up, that head started to slide back because there's not enough room. Um, so that's a good indication that there's probably a cesarean in her future if we can't do that right, if we can't get that head and those feet and the pelvis at the same time. Sometimes it's an indicator of a dead fetus, whether it be a stillborn um, or premature or a failed abortion, we'll see head backs a lot because there just isn't that muscle tone that that calf needs to maintain the posture to be delivered correctly. If it is a correctable head back, a lot of times we can grab either that lower jaw or get a hold of an ear and work that head around um, to a point where I can get my hand under it and pull it around. Um, if they're severe ones, like especially if I have a severe head back where I'm fairly certain that calf is dead, you know, I'm coming out with hair or something like that. Um, I can work in there with a head snare uh, to try and snare that head and bring it around and get that calf delivered without a cesarean section. So elbow locks are really common um, and actually one of the more easy to correct. So they're kind of fun to do. Um, what that really means is just that those elbows are, are back under the 
the chest of that calf and we've pushed it up into the pelvis and that we don't have, instead of having that nice feet extended posture, we're getting those elbows locked down below the pelvis. Um, we can see single or double, so one foot or two that are kind of back under the nose. And correcting these is really just a matter of, like I said, some patience and some traction at the right time. We're gonna put our chains on those feet and we're gonna, we may need to push that shoulder back a little bit in that opposite leg or even push that head back. I usually just put a hand on the forehead and just do some gentle firm push. And a lot of times we can pop that elbow up, um, pull that leg forward. One at a time, we're gonna do one leg at a time, not both if it's a double elbow lock. And then once we get that, those legs extended, usually we can deliver the calf without any trouble. Uh, uterine torsions, uh, we get calls on fairly commonly. And usually the call I get is that we had this cow, we've been watching her for a while. She acts like she's in labor. Maybe even we've seen the membranes, um, get her up into the shed and go to check her and she's just not dilated. Maybe we even gave her a couple hours and let her push a little bit and she's still not dilating. What do we do? We can't get her to, to do what she needs to do. And the really key component to this is when you go in to check those cows, your hand is gonna wanna pull either clockwise or counterclockwise. It's really just a twist of that cervix as that uterus is flipped over and tours um, that you're feeling. It's not really the cervix that's not dilating, it's the fact that that uterus is is really just twisting like a balloon in a sense. The biggest problem with these is a lot of times they go too long before we realize that's what we've got going on because they do require fairly prompt attention because the blood supply is also usually wrapped up in that twist. So the blood supply to that uterus and that calf is compromised. So they require pretty prompt attention um, to get a live calf out of this situation. In some patients, we can correct them with the torsion bar which is just a bar we kind of um, put on that calf's feet and try and twist the calf, which we hope in turn will twist the uterus with it. Uh, I, in my hands, don't have great luck with those. Uh, the other thing you'll see, uh, especially in dairy practices, is they'll want to roll the cow and try and unroll the uterus by rolling the cow over um, while putting a plank or, or standing on her. Um, don't do that in beef practice just because we don't have patients that are very uh, amenable to me laying them down and standing on them. So usually these will go to C-section. We can either do a full C-section where I get in there and I decide that the best option for the cow and the calf is to, is to get in there through my flank incision, uh, incise the uterus, take the calf and be done with it. Uh, we can, if it's a small calf, You'll see sometimes where we'll make that flank incision, realize we can roll that uterus from the inside, and then we'll have you deliver the calf normally. Saves us an incision into the uterus um, and all that damage with potential complications for breed back. So that's an option sometimes you'll see pursued. Um, hip lock calves are, first of all, don't panic. I know that's hard to do, but calves, once they're delivered out to the hips, they, we've got some time. Their chest isn't involved. They can actually, you've seen those where the cow lays there before she gives that final push. They'll pick their head up. They'll shake, shake their ears out, take a breath, do some things, some leave them ball. So we've got some time if that calf is hip locked. So don't panic because the biggest thing you don't wanna do is you want to make sure you don't make it worse by pulling harder, right? These, the cow and the calf, the reason they hip lock is those is the pelvis of the cow is holding on to the hips of that calf because they're not lined up correctly. So the more you pull, the more you risk damage to the cow's pelvis or the calf's hips. We can actually break calf hips doing this. Um, if you can correct it, the best way to do it from the outside is to rotate that calf so that that hip angle is more favorable to the pelvis. If you've ever kind of sat in the pasture and watched a cow have a calf from start to finish, you'll notice when she gets that calf out to the chest and gets that far, a lot of times you'll see a pause or break in the action, right? And you'll go, ooh, I wonder if I need to go help her. Don't go help her because what's happening is there's a natural instinct to take that pause where that calf shifts his hips and that cow's uterus shifts to line that calf up so she can make that final push and deliver those hips correctly. So don't pull harder. You have to rotate the hips if you wanna deliver that calf. 
the best way to per, to fix a hip lock is not to create one in the first place. Don't rush. And that's why I say it's not a timed event. Don't rush pulling that calf. Let that calf rotate as it comes out um, to pass through that pelvic open opening correctly. Uh, if you get a severe hip lock or if you have a dead calf, uh, the ultimate answer is that we end up doing a phytotomy, which means we cut that calf into pieces to get him out. Uh, obviously, it's not very productive to go in and try and do a C-section and pull 90% of that calf back through the pelvis to deliver him. So we end up doing that. Um, we can euthanize a live calf and deliver by phytotomy if we need to, uh, but it's not it's not really fun. Nobody wants to do it. Um, so basically, don't create one in the first place if you can help it. Um, twins are a fun project, and sometimes they're not twins, right? The all four feet presentation is not uncommon. And the decision point you have to make is, is it one calf with four feet? or two calves with each of their two feet in, in the opening, right? And so the anatomical cues are really important. Front feet, front legs bend differently than back ones, right? You've got either a hock or a knee and they bend in opposite directions. So those are good cues to decide if you've got a front foot or a back foot, regardless of whether they're upside down or right side up. And then the other thing that's really important and I'll even do it in fairly normal calvings, I'll go in and check that cow. And what I'm doing is I'm tracking back to the shoulders of that calf to make sure I've got a head and two feet that all belong to the same individual. Because it's not very productive to be pulling on a head of one calf and two feet of the other calf. Uh, it doesn't fit, doesn't work. Um, so if you do find that you've got two calves trying to hit the exit at the same time, biggest thing is you've got to decide which one you need to get out first make a decision and then you have to you're going to put some firm pressure on the other one to kind of tuck him back in the apartment until you can let him out later so and then always always even if you deliver a four feet from the same calf delivery always always check for that second calf right just to make sure um, the upside down calf is a fairly um, it's a fairly labor intensive correction, but it's certainly doable if you're patient and you kind of work with the cow. They can usually be rolled and usually I'll roll them by putting good firm pressure on one shoulder or the other, um, keeping the head kind of tucked in my elbow as we put traction on that calf. And as it comes forward, a lot of times you can just kind of make that slow barrel roll uh, and get that calf lined up and out. Uh, head first, Upside down are fairly easy to correct. Uh, tail first are significantly harder. And even myself, a lot of times, I'll just take those to C-section if I've got a live calf, not rather than to risk the life of that calf. Um, fetal anomalies, where all the rules go out the window. So you will, this is usually the phone call where you get in there to check and see what you've got and make your game plan and you go, holy moly, I got no idea what I've got here. Um, most of these end up in C-section or phytotomy, uh, depending on what they are. Uh, this little Charlet pair is a set of conjoined twins. They were conjoined at the chest. Um, this little guy obviously is a two-headed calf. He came out by C-section. Um, both his heads were not fitting through the through the exit. Um, this guy is what you'll hear referred to as a inside out calf or a schistosoma reflexus. And what that basically means is he's been folded in half the wrong way. Um, he's folded in half on his spine. That abdominal wall fails to close. And so we've got um, all those abdominal organs kind of free floating. They usually present as all four feet coming towards the exit or I'll get the phone call that um, it looks like she's trying to deliver her own intestines. Um, that can't be, right? And it's not, it's, it's fetal intestines. Um, they're nearly always dead. This one I was able to get out by a phytotomy. I'd say about 30% of them, I can do that. Um, the other 60% probably, 70%. Um, we end up doing C-sections on just because we can't. Um, it's less traumatic for the cow to go through the C-section than it is for me to try and get all the fetal cuts um, when the fetus isn't arranged right. And then this guy um, down here was a hydrocephalus. 
we were able to do a partial fetotomy on him. His head was about the size of a basketball. So different reasons for these. Um, some of them are just bad luck. Some of them can be toxins ingested during gestation. Uh, I was in an area where lupine was really common. So we see a lot of um, angular limb deformities in those pastures at times. So um, it's worth the conversation if you're seeing these on um, why, but a lot of times the answer is it's just flat out bad luck. Um, some post calving care. So we've got that calf delivered um, one way or another, right? We've got a calf on the ground, regardless of which hole we had to work out of. Um, one of the things that's become very important or very forward in the industry in the last probably five to 10 years is um, control of pain in cattle. And kind of my rule of thumb has become that any, any cow or heifer that has had an assisted birth is certainly a candidate for pain mitigation. Um, anything that I do a C-section on is, is definitely gonna get some pain mitigation. Our local anesthesia that we use in cattle usually is lidocaine. Um, so that, that flank block, if we do a C-section or that epidural, if we're doing a hard calving, um, the duration of action is about four to six hours. So if you've ever had a major surgery, um, you know that four to six hours is not long enough pain control to kind of get you through that recovery period. So a lot of times I will go, my kind of go-to for choice is meloxicam, uh, mainly because it's oral and I can have uh, producers give it really easily. Uh, the other option is obviously uh, flunixin or banamine is the trade name, but you do have to remember that ha that has to go IV or our withdrawals change significantly. So a lot of guys aren't comfortable giving that IV. Um, we can go with the meloxicam. This cow here, um, as you can see, she had a C-section. I give them meloxicam just by putting that dose. It comes in nice little tablets, just throw it in a little bit of sweet feed. They eat it right up. It's a nice product. Um, any calf that I deliver by forced extraction, so any calf I pull, or any calf that has experienced prolonged labor. So those little guys that you get out there, maybe a heifer calf that you get out there and their little muzzles swollen or their tongues kind of flopping around a little bit swollen, those are good candidates for an anti-inflammatory. The other thing I'll throw out there on this slide is those calves that if we deliver them in their face, their tongue is swollen, or if we deliver them through a C-section, um, they're gonna get tubed by me. Um, we're gonna milk that cow out. We're gonna make sure we get colostrum into that calf. We know that any calf that goes through kind of an un, unfortunate delivery situation uh, is not nearly as likely to get colostrum in a timely manner or in an adequate manner. So I've got everybody caught, they're gonna get it whether they like it or not. Um, the other nice thing is if you're tubing that calf and you wanna give them some meloxicam, I just toss those tablets right in the, right in the tour. Um, they go down with the colostrum, it's all done. So uh, the one thing to point out, pain control around labor and delivery or neonatal calves is all off label. So any product that you use has to be done with a conversation with your vet. They have to have that conversation with you um, to approve that off-label usage. So easiest way to do that is before you start calving, have a conversation with them. Um, just put a protocol in place. Set up an SOP that you've got some things that are going to trigger the use, that you want to use pain control for um, so that you've got how you're going to do it, when you're going to do it, why you're going to do it, um, and then you're good to go. Uh, antibiotic therapy is, I get a lot of questions. I treat antibiotic therapy post-calving very case by case. Um, obviously surgical interventions, especially field surgery, if we end up getting um, called out into, into some of the farther flung areas where we maybe don't have the best facilities or the best situations to do surgery, those are definitely gonna get antibiotics. Um, contaminated deliveries are a potential for for antibiotics. So, you know, that calf that's maybe, you know, maybe we missed her in the back 40 and that calf was, was pretty rotten by the time we got it pulled, things like that. Those definitely go on the list for consideration for antibiotics as well. Um, again, because it's labor and delivery and the products are not approved for that scenario, um, they're all off-label usages. So again, just have that conversation with your veterinarian um, so you can put that protocol in place for your operation. Uh, calving paralysis is something we see relatively common to varying degrees. 
And the underlying cause of calving paralysis is there are two fairly significant design flaws in the bovine pelvis. Um, there are two fairly large nerves that run through that pelvis that are pretty much unprotected um, for all intents and purposes. And they're fairly important nerves for the function of the hind limbs. Um, so if we have a cow that either has, um, maybe we don't have a very good positioning on that, that calf as we're delivering it, or it's a big calf that we squeak through that maybe we shouldn't have, um, we can put a lot of pressure on those two nerves and we can cause calving paralysis. Um, it can range from fairly mild, like this gal here probably had a pretty difficult calving, but she's still on her feet. She's probably going to do fine, but she's going to have some deficits for a few days. Her posture is going to be off. Her gait is going to be a little questionable. She's probably not going to travel to feed and water quite as well as, as she should. Um, this gal here is a pretty is a very severe case of calving paralysis. You'll so you'll see that spraddle leg, or we call them split out. Um, and uh, the biggest problem with with this is that. Nerves recover extremely slowly. If, if you've had nerve damage at any point or had one of those injuries, you know that um, it does not come back quickly, if at all. So again, that conversation with your vet, uh, obviously we want to try and avoid these and prevent having them by, by having some attention to how those calving protocols are done. But if we do get in a situation where we have, you know, a cow that looks like this, um, we need to have a down cow protocol in place uh, on our operations so that we know, um, you know, my rule of thumb is that if we don't see some pretty significant progression in about 48 hours, then we have the conversation about euthanasia. So just things like that, that you need to have that conversation and be aware of um, before they happen. Uh, prolapses. There's four different prolapses on this slide. Um, two of them are two in the morning calls. Two of them are, and I'll see at eight tomorrow morning. I didn't get Slido set up. If I were Brian, I would have had Slido set up and made everybody answer. Um, this is a two in the morning call. And this one is a two in the morning call. Um, both of those are uterine prolapses. And what that happens is we can see either a drop in calcium or uterine inertia. So that uterus is just exhausted and tired um, or a poor positioning. You know, if you if you calve in a hilly area, you've probably seen one of these where a heifer gets herself just in a bad spot. And so she has that calf and she keeps right on pushing. And what happens is she pushes it all out. There's her uterus. Um, but the, the issue again, like we talked with uterine torsion, there's a really significant blood supply to that organ at this point, just because of that support of that calf. So there's a couple of vessels in there that are about the size of your thumb. And if they rupture those vessels, it takes about, about five to 10 minutes for them to bleed out uh, internally. So we wanna get these addressed um, and replaced as quickly as possible. They're also a lot easier to put back if they're really fresh. Um, so, and yeah, so those are, those are the ones that call me. We need to get those addressed. Also don't handle those cows very much if you can help it. Um, every time we move them, we run the risk of, of rupturing those vessels. So a rule of thumb is just if we can have them somewhere, let them relax until we get there to replace that prolapse, that's best. Um, I know that's not always possible in field conditions, but, but that's the ideal setup. Um, this is a rectal prolapse. Uh, and then this is a vaginal prolapse. So you'll see these pretty commonly um, in cows that are getting close to calving or getting pretty springy just because all those muscles relax, um, that, that vaginal wall is starting to relax. So we'll see, see different, different degrees of vaginal prolapses, but we usually replace them and put a stitch in, but uh, they're certainly not a life-threatening emergency. Um, so that wraps up everything I have, I would be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Becky. Do you have any questions for Becky? If you guys do, you can unmute or throw any questions you have in the chat. Check here and see. 
So this is a, this is a terrible talk to give over Zoom because I <laughs> do things when I. <laughs> I was going to say I was you know thinking we have that wonderful cow on campus yeah. where we can oh. throw calves in and get them in different positions. I think maybe maybe we just need to have another calving school or something where we can use the cow and get some hands on stuff. Um, so kind of get get things started. Um, so. For many producers, maybe you're an hour plus from a vet. Uh, what would be some different thoughts or management suggestions uh, for them to think about um, prior to the calving season? Yeah, so a lot of them um, are, a lot of what I touched on is there, you know, there's several conversations to have with your vet so that, you know, if you want to use a pain management strategy on a cow that had a hard pull that you were comfortable doing, um, I'm all for it. But I don't want to talk to you about it at one in the morning. So if you'll talk to me about it in the office, um, we can set up those protocols. I can make sure you're very comfortable doing whatever you elect to go with. Um, and doing that. The other thing is, is, you know, the point of make that decision sooner rather than later. Um, I had lots of clients who were an hour to an hour and a half from the clinic um, by drive. And so they got very good at, at checking that cow and, and making that decision because they knew that she was going to need to be on a trailer. You've got time but you don't have time to waste, if that makes sense. Make that decision, um, make the phone call. Um, we're always more than happy to help you with emergencies. That's what we're there for. Um, but, but yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing is, is, you know, make that assessment, decide what you're comfortable with um, and make the call so that you can get on the road if you need to. Great. Uh, so Dwight has a question in, in the chat. Is there anything in particular that causes abnormal presentation? And why are there some years that are worse than others? Sure. Um, so that's the million dollar question, right? If I, if I could answer that one, uh, then I could figure out how to prevent it and I wouldn't be here. But, um, you know, we do see certain things that seem to lend themselves you know, we talked about like maternal fetal mismatches. A lot of times when we start talking to producers, we, we can track that back to, um, you know, a certain bull selection, an AI selection, you know, or decision-making process that, and it not necessarily they pick the wrong bull, they just pick the wrong bull for their herd. Um, or, you know, or uh, heifer selection is really key. I mentioned uh, pelvic measuring you can head off a lot of problems if you if you continually having problems with immature heifers then we maybe need to look at your heifer selection program and and what we're doing there um you know if, if you've got heifers heifers especially but cows as well that are super thin going into calving we're going to see a lot more dystocias just because those guys those gals run out of gas you know if they get into a little bit of a tough calving situation a good cow in good shape with lots of room, she'll kind of power through maybe a less than ideal presentation and deliver that calf. But if she don't have, if she doesn't have the body reserves to do that, uh, we can end up in trouble pretty quickly. So those are a few things. Um, I don't know if that's all the answers, but but some things to keep in mind. So uh, Becky, you talked about hip locks and about, you know, giving her time to, to see if she's gonna, gonna get that done on her own. And I know that we want to avoid intervention if we don't need to. How long on average would you wait before you would even consider intervening? So honestly, as long as if we're watching and as long as that calf's nose is uncut, you know, we don't have a membrane issue where that calf has has membranes over its nose, you know, if it's heads up and it's doing the head shake and it's, you know, maybe starting to talk, um, there isn't any reason to really intervene. She'll, she'll take care of that. And a lot of times if, if you do intervene, um, you'll, you will just do just that. You can make it worse. You know, we've all seen those calves that, or those cows that, um, you know, they're 90% of the way there and they're kind of laying there catching their breath and that calf is laid out behind him, 
and we go to see if they're okay and they jump up and the calf goes with them. <laughs> so um, yeah, as long as there's not a specific reason that you're afraid that calf is struggling, um, I'd probably just leave well enough alone until unless she unless she does get up and demonstrate that there is a true hip lock there. Looks like uh, we've got a question from Frank. Uh, when calving in cold weather or a muddy field, is it okay to move a cow to a pin uh, when there might be a hoof showing, or is it better to let um, her finish calving and then take her to a clean pen? So honestly, as long, so a lot of this depends on temperament, right? Because if, you know, my cow herd, my cows are used to me, they're pretty easy going. Um, I'm always going to move them because uh, I'm a believer in Murphy's Law. If the, right, if there's a mud puddle out there and you have a heifer, she will have a calf in that mud puddle. It's it's guaranteed. So yeah, if you have you know if you have the the temperament in your cow herd that you can do that without really you know upsetting the apple cart, I I I tend to move them. Now if they're laying down pushing hard. Um, getting the job done, that's probably not the time to do it. But yeah, if you're just seeing those fetal membranes and toe sticking out, I'd get them to a clean spot if, if you can, calmly. Great, are there any other questions from those of you that are on tonight? We've had some really good questions and discussions so far, so check in. Becky, we had a question about a possibility of getting uh, a copy of your slides. Would you be willing to share your slides with us and we can send them out on a, an email to those who registered? Yeah, absolutely. So I don't have a problem with that at all. All right, we'll, we'll take care of that when we get the recording up too. Perfect, I didn't see that, that question up there. I had to scroll back up. Perfect. Well, oh, let's see, Frank, we had one breech uh, birth this year, came out feet first. It ended up calving on its own. When is the danger of umbilical cord uh, breaking? Okay, so if they come out feet first, but backwards, that's a backwards calf. And when we talk about breech calvings, we're talking about true breech, which are those like you will see a tail hanging out, right? That's your first indication that things have gone way bad wrong. Um, so we are talking about when we, when I'm talking about breach deliveries, I'm talking about that true breach where the feet are underneath um, and that's come in tail first. So there are actually a phenomenally large amount of calves that are born backwards. Um, so yeah, so, and it, it is a risk and that's, you always wonder when we see still, stillborn calves and nice mature cows, if that isn't an issue or I do anyway, because yeah, when the, when the hips pass through the pelvis, like when you're starting to see the rear of that calf come through the vulva, that umbilical cord is functionally pinched off. So it has no more life support from mama. So things need to move in a fairly rapid pace. We've got a question here from Emily. Can, can you also see problems if heifers are on the fatter side instead of uh, thin? Yes, you can. <laughs> Anybody that's ever calved feedlot heifers <laughs> can tell you all about that. Um, yeah, so again, that, that pelvis is not completely mature. So we're dealing with space at a premium to start with. And if we've got heifers that are fat enough that they have some fat deposition starting to show up around that pelvis, you know, we're decreasing that space even more. Um, so yeah, we can see heifers are very much a critter that we really want to hit that sweet spot because when we get out of it, things go south. So what's the body condition score you're, you're talking about as a sweet spot here? I like that five and a half to six at calving. Um, Yep, 
Yeah, Mike was just typing that he said that question. So, yeah. <laughs> and if we're um, thinking, yeah, it's also those see those that you'll see them milk, not milk as well, too. So, I mean, we really. Yeah, when so would you say more getting up into that that seven body condition and, and greater when we're, yeah. we're seeing a lot of that fat deposition and the mammary glands, we start compounding, I think, the issue there a little bit with some of those fatter heifers. Yep, exactly. Okay. Uh, Paul has a question. Uh, what things would you look for in an ideal calving facility to address issues, including, uh, you know, a C-section? So uh, in a minimalistic facility, what are some things producers can do to help make calving difficulties maybe easier? So uh, thinking about shoot or head catch areas, sure. what, what would be some tools to, to help with that? Yeah, so um, bare minimum for calving facilities, um, head catch, some way to catch your head, and then something with a swing away, swing away panels. Um, both sides ideally, uh, left side if you're, is a minimum, right? Because that's where we're gonna do that C-section if it comes to that, yep. And as far as being able to do a C-section in your facility, um, good light, overhead light is great. Um, and then the other thing that's really nice, but I'm probably one of the few people that has one in their barn is an overhead pulley is super nice. Um, and just a hand pulley, uh, or even a rafter, we can throw a rope over because when we go to bring that calf out the C-section, it's an upward motion and it's, it's, it's nice to have some, some physics on your side. So um, those are kind of the, the bare minimum. Um, obviously, we'd love to have, you know, heated and hot water. And <laughs> um, but that goes to the other thing is, is, um, you know, don't. The other thing I'll tell guys is, honestly, during calving season, I tell my guys to just leave your trailer hooked up if you can. Because the, the ideal situation is to get that calf out healthy, that cow to heal up and rebreed if we have to do a C-section. And the best chance of doing that, honestly, is if you haul them into a good surgical facility. I know it stinks in the middle of the night, um, but it's the best chance for everybody. <laughs>